Well, we just appreciate you joining us in our series on growing in prayer. And in this short little 12 minute segment, we're looking at abiding in Christ and cultivating union with God. And of course, the classic verse is John chapter, I mean, the chapter is John 15, and there's many facets of abiding in Christ. Your favorite verse. It's one of them. It's my, one of my favorite chapters because there's about five or six verses in John 15 that are so like profound. absolutely big time. Mm-hmm. But uh, and here I'm going to read it and I and I and I use this or I apply this uh, this verse on several of our segments because it's so central to growing in prayer, the abiding and uh, abiding in the vine. Jesus says, "I am the vine, you are the branches." He that abides in me, but then he has this other phrase, and I abide in you. Yes. And some folks miss that part. I abide in you. That's a critical part. He goes, that person will bear much fruit. So there's two way. There's two components here. And each of those components, I'm suggesting at least three dimensions to each one of those two components. So, but first, let's go to the basics. He goes, I'm the vine. I'm the source of the life. Or you could call it the power or the creative wisdom or the motivation. I'm the source of it. I'm the vine. You're the branch. You're the vessel that's going to give expression to my wisdom, my power, my presence, my life. Now, I could skip you and just release it if I wanted to, but I don't want to. I want to do it with you together, connected with you. So here's what you need to do. Abide in me. I consider this one of the top and possibly the top uh, main exhortation in the word of God. And it's from the lips of Jesus. Abide in me. Stay connected to my heart. And there's several components to that. He goes, stay connected to my heart and then I will inspire your heart. I will abide in you. Now, this second component, I will abide in you, he's not talking about just the fact that you're born again and you have the indwelling spirit. That's already a given. He's talking about, I'm going to move on your heart. I'm going to, I'm going to inspire and impart things to your mind and understanding. I'm going to abide. I'm going to manifest my life inside of you. And now we know his spirit is already in us, but we want our emotions and our mind to be under the influence of the spirit. And that's what this means when he abides in you. Our emotions and our mind are under the influence of the Spirit. He's dwelling in us in that sense. So let's look at this subject of bearing much fruit. And so we bear fruit in two ways. One is the fruit of the Spirit. Character develops in our life. But the other is we bear fruit by we're impacting other people by our words and our deeds. And the way we're impacting them, not just helping them, that's good. But it's more than that. Bearing fruit is more than just helping them and them appreciating you, though, I, again, I appreciate that. Uh, it's words and deeds, simple ones, weak ones, but it inspires them to think about Jesus Godward. They're thinking, I love him a little bit more. I think about him a little bit more. That's the fruit. Because uh, if my sermons and my acts of service, even the little small ones, don't make people take pause and think of him and even respond to him a little bit that I haven't borne fruit. I've only, I've only kind of, you know, they enjoyed the conversation or the sermon, but it didn't actually bear fruit if they don't have a little movement forward in their walk with Jesus. Mm. Even an unbeliever, they're not moved forward a little bit to think about him. That's yeah. what the fruit bearing really, really is, is responding to Jesus. So Mike, how does this practically in your life, so say if I'm applying this truth, um, you know, I. I I'm thinking about, okay, I want to grow in humility. Because so, you're talking about two ways of fruit, internal and then fruit that bears in other people's lives. But unless you abide in me, you will bear no fruit. So say, I want to bear a fruit of humility. But over the years, I found that, Lord, give me humility doesn't, that, that his life is not as simple as that. Uh-huh, right. So, so that how do you, prayer is important, important, but it's, it's not enough. Right. So how do you abide like practically? Because you can respond in humility even without feeling anything. And, mm. and we need to. Uh-huh. But humility takes root in you when the spirit actually infuses it into your character. And meaning I need to humble myself, whether I feel inspired right. to humble myself, whether I like it, I humble myself. But there's times where you actually delight in it. You think this 
act. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, now it's part of your character or it's starting to be formed in your character. It's not just a decision huh. of humility. It's actually, I've inspired it in you. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of you. You're, you're not dreading it. You're not gulping down like this is so dreadful. Why do I have to be humble right now? And that is a beginning stage of humility. But when he inspires it in you, mm -hmm. you actually it's not distasteful. It's not odious. It's not like, ugh. It's like, man, I, it feels clean to do this. And the Lord goes, where did that idea come from? Where did that emotion come from? It feels clean and good to be humble. He says, look, I've changed you. That isn't you. That's not you humbling yourself a hundred times and therefore you, therefore you got used to it. I've actually inspired it. So in from you. duty becomes delight. Delu duty to delight. But the duty is important on the front right, end. Right, right. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? I've identified, again, in my Growing in Prayer book, I've got a chapter or two on this, right. and, and I break down some of the components. Abiding in, in Christ, because that's what we're called to do, and then he promises to abide or to move on our soul, our mind and our emotions to inspire us. And so I'm taking more, uh, I'm putting more attention on my part of it, abiding in Christ. I have three components that I talk about when it's to abide, when I encourage people to abide in Christ. Number one, talk to him. Abiding in Christ starts with talking to him. It, that's not the fullness of it, but that's a huge part of it. Matter of fact, it is so foundational, uh, the talking to him part, that sometimes when I read this passage, instead of saying, abide in me and I'll abide in you. I say, talk to me and the Lord will talk to you. Yeah. I use the word talk almost as an inner, interchanging with the word abiding because the majority of abiding is around talking to him. And it can be little short five and 10 second little sound bite whispers. It doesn't mean an hour long every time. So it's a conversation. It's, but, and it's an ongoing conversation. I don't mean all day you never break the conversation. But that you have those little short five and ten second little whispers throughout the day. Now, if you have an hour with the Lord and you or whatever the time is, right, it, there's right, nothing right, special right, about an right, hour. Right. You, but you have an hour with the Lord. You spend time with the Lord. You're going to sustain that whispered conversation far better through the day. You get rid of that concentrated time with the Lord. That whispered conversation will start diminishing. Mm -hmm. You'll quit doing it it'll go way down because mm. I've seen that whispered conversation increase proportionate to the times I set apart to talk to him where I put everything aside and it's my prayer time focused. Then throughout the day, I maintain that talking with him much, much more. Is that what Paul meant when he said pray without ceasing? Probably that and okay. more, probably a little bit more, but, but that's a real good. In my little mind, I thought, how do you pray without stopping? But if that's what it means, like abiding in him, as in continual that's the, com that's it, the essence of what Paul means, right. but it's a little more than keeping the conversation going. Right. Because you can be, your hands can be busy, you know, you're at the work, you're a right. teacher at school, you're teaching the, the third graders, you know, uh -huh. multiplication, right. and you're not talking to Jesus. Mm. But, but the fact that you have whispers through the day, you're still conscious of him and you're still open to receive from him even while you're teaching them multiplication right. and so it doesn't mean you stop everything and stay in that conversation so so it's bigger than that mm. so talking to him is, is number one number two which a lot of believers will acknowledge this but they don't actually do it abiding in him applying his promises meaning <clears throat> there's a promise uh, there is no condemnation in Christ mm. that you're a new creation in Christ those are promises so when I abide in, in Christ, I talk to him, but I need to also apply the promises. When an enemy wants to stir up rejection and condemnation, I say, no, in the name of Jesus, no, I'm not going there. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a, abiding is part of it is applying the promises when you're talking to him. I'm not going to succumb to a spirit of condemnation and accusation and rejection. I'm not going to just talk to him because if you just talk to him, but you don't draw on the promises, you're just, oh, woe is me. I'm so bad. I promise I'll never sin again. I'm so bad. Just give me a little cabin on the edge of glory. I won't bother with anybody anymore. He's going, no, that's not abiding in me. You're not taking my word at face value. Because to, to apply his promises means you're honoring what he said while you're talking to him. Mm. So a lot of people approach him as the beat down beggar pauper. Oh, woe is me, woe is me. I don't want to be bringing trouble up there in heaven. Just woe. He goes, I've already said things real strong and you don't believe any of them. You're not honoring anything I've done on the cross and resurrection. 
that it matter to you and you think you're abiding in me because you keep the conversation going? So it's more than conversation. I think conversation's the, the big chunk, but you do it in a spirit of applying his promises. Does that make sense? Makes sense, that makes sense. And then the third part is a spirit of obedience because I can abide in him, keep the conversation going. I mean, again, not 100%, right. but throughout the day, and I can be applying the promises. I believe who I am in Christ. I'm not just the little beggar begging you to forgive me one more time where he goes, I already have. <laughs> Let's change the conversation. But I also have a spirit of obedience. I have a abiding in him also implies and includes I honor your leadership. That's the spirit of obedience. I honor your word. What you said is more important than what I feel. And I keep the conversation going. So I honor your leadership, spirit of obedience. I honor the words that you said, your words are more important to me than my negative feelings. I will take your word at face value as triumphing over my negative feelings and emotions and I'll keep the conversation going. You put the three together uh -huh. and you stay with it. And it's not like the next week everything is different, but a month goes by, another month goes by, another month goes by, another month goes by, and all of a sudden, I don't know about all of a sudden, right. I mean little by little is the right. better way to say it, he's abiding in you now. Now your emotions and your thinking, he's inspiring them more. I mean, he wants to anyway, but right. he says, I'm waiting for you to get in the line of the conversation. Then I'll start changing some of your dark emotions and some of your dark thinking. Uh -huh. You're lining up with me. That's him abiding in us. It's, I mean, his Holy Spirit lives in our human spirit the day we're born again. But our emotions, our mind, emotions, our feelings, our thinkings are not always lined up with him. Right. When we're lining up with him, that's what he means in this passage, I'll abide in you. I will manifest my influence on your dark emotions and dark thinking and change them as you abide in me in the way I just described. Wow. So if we do that, we bear fruit if we stay with it. Mm. And there, there's no substitute for this. There's no go to the ministry line at the end of church, pray for me. Pray, Lord. I've had people say, come and pray that the Lord will Divine give me. Divine importation. Yeah, yeah. Imp the passion of, for God you have. And I go, well, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, I can pray <laughs> that the Lord inspire you in the next 12 hours. Were the old, all the Korean ladies wanting to be prayed? <laughs> and so I'm not commenting on that. Okay. I need them on my team praying for me. That's the strongest prayer force in the world, I think. <laughs> and I love, I love that, that hunger, value hunger, of yeah, wanting impartation, right. but impartation is not a substitute for your history in God. Mm. I can't give you my history in God by laying on of hands and someone can't give me their history in God. Right. It's the day-by-day -day conversation and interaction as That's your so history important. in God. But you could pray and they can get a little jumpstart inspiration, right. but if they don't do anything with it, that inspiration will lift and they're back to where they were. So anyway, that's growing in prayer, abiding in Christ, absolutely foundational to growing in prayer. We're continuing our series on growing in prayer, looking at some of the practical details of how to actually do it. And in this little 12 minute segment, we're looking at a practical plan of how to grow in prayer. Some things you can actually do to make it work. Now, we talk a lot about loving God with all of your heart, the first commandment, but that's not enough. I mean, that's the engine for sure, but you can love God with all your heart. I mean, really be sincere. I love you and I want to obey you and I'm dead, totally sincere. But if you don't have a couple other things in place, you're not going to you're not going to progress as much and i like to identify three things and they when i identify them i've taught this for 40 years by the way and and i'm only saying that to say whenever i bring these up the first especially the first two people go what always it's what <laughs> and i go let me finish let me finish and then let's see where your prayer life is in a year or two from now because I'm really confident in these three things that will dynamically change your prayer life. But on the first hearing of it, it, it seems a little nebulous. Uh, tell us tell the secret, Mike. Okay, here's the secret. Number one, <laughs> it's not an order. Number one, set a schedule for times where you have concentrated prayer. Put it on your weekly schedule, the hour, Maybe it's, say it's a one hour block. Some people it's 30 minutes, some it's longer, two hours, whatever. That's not my business right now to talk about that. Set it in your schedule. If you don't set it in your schedule, but you only pray 
when an opportunity makes itself, you will rarely pray. You will rarely pray. I assure you, having struggled with a prayer life and really take hold of it over the, I'm talking 40 years, this is really true. Yeah, we need to pay attention to that. No, it's, it's really true. <laughs> and we'll get to that in a second. The second one is, make, this almost is, sounds as ugly and boring, make a prayer list. What? Make, and the third one That's is, true. you have to have a right view of God. You have to, if he's the angry coach, the disengaged father, that's the image, you're not going to stay with it. Well, let's go to the very first one. Well, first, I'm going I'm I'm to throw something out there. I, I've said this again for 40 years. I'm going to say it again. If you make a schedule, I'm talking about a person you really love Jesus, you're going for it, and you get a prayer list, and you have a right view of God, here's, I like to make this. They always go, what? You will pray. Da, 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 I need a drum roll. You will pray 10 times more in the next 12 months than you have the last 12 months. I believe it. And, but I've said that over the years, and almost everyone says, what are you talking sounds about? sounds so non-spiritual. And right? I say, okay, tell me about your prayer life. Not how much you wanted to pray, how much you actually did pray in the last year. And all, a lot of folks, they push back on this. And so the reason you make a schedule, because there's so many demands on our time, and if we're not intentional about making time for this, I make a time, I have a schedule in my, I mean, I am I set apart time in my schedule for a number of things in my life that are non-negotiable. And so when something else comes across my life, I don't, I mean, maybe 10% of the time I'll violate that schedule, but the vast majority, 85, 90%, I will not because it's consecrated time. It's a set time and an appointment. I have time with the Lord. I have time with my family. And I, I don't keep it every time, but I have it <clears throat> locked in and I won't move those boundary lines when something else comes. I have times for other things as well. But I, I've liked to say over the years that if you don't schedule your time emergencies and other people will schedule your time and if you just leave it to the wind it will not happen how do you call it the t tyranny of the tyranny of the, the urgency. urgency yeah yeah yes it's and true. instead of the priority of what's important you'll live under the tyranny of the urgent they'll knock on yeah. the door they'll have a social thing they'll have an emergency they got to talk to you and only you here's a new opportunity here's a new show here's a new it's just it's just a buzz of activity, good, bad, and ugly. And the tyranny of the urgent will get you. That's why we love our sacred trust. Yeah, our sacred trust at the International House of Prayer at IHOP, we commit to X amount of prayer meetings per week, and they get to pick the schedule of the time. But that time, I ask them to make it a sacred part of their life. And it saves you. Because a lot of folks go, well, it's the Lord, he understands. And I go, it's not about God being mad. Like I remember talking to a guy once and I said, no, it's my prayer time now. And they were all, we're, it was at a conference actually, but I had a, even when I would travel and uh, I did for three or four years in the early nineties, I traveled a bit, but I still had scheduled time with the Lord, even in my conference world. And they were all going out for dinner and they said, uh, let's go. I go, no, nah, no, nah, I, I don't feel inspired to pray. I don't feel any big deal, but it, it's on my schedule. I just do it. And the guy said, well, God won't mind if you do it. I go, I know he doesn't. He's so gracious. I'm the one that will mind. <laughs> I'm the one, not that it's going to be a great time, but if I give away those one and two and three hour shots all the time, I end up a month and two and three and four later, I've not done it. Yeah, totally. So I'll ask you last night, uh, right now, you're listening, in the last 30 days, how much time have you actually set apart? I mean, did you actually set apart and pray? And most sincere believers go, oops, well, last month was hard. Okay, do the month before. Well, that was really hard too. Right? <laughs> I go, that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I first got a hold of this, I was only about 18, 19 years old. I was at the university, maybe 19, something like that. And an older man of God came and told me this. He goes, when's your scheduled prayer time? He was part of the Navigators Ministry. You know, they have, they're more dedicated and they're more, you know, got things organized. And I went, I don't ever schedule time to pray. I just kind of pray on the run. He goes, how much do you pray? I go, almost never. <laughs> he goes, there's a reason. I go, well, prayer's boring. He goes, yeah, I, I get that, but there's a reason you don't pray. It's not a priority on your schedule. It's not something that you will push things away to make sure you stay with. Yeah. He goes, I'm going to tell you this. He goes, you take the next three months. 
you pick an hour. Even if you don't make it the whole hour, you take set an hour apart. Even if you cave in in the hour and give up, which I did a few times. And he goes, I promise you the next three months you'll pray so much more than you have at any three month period of your life. I was at university and I went, oh, okay. He goes, try it. So I picked nine o'clock at night because you know, I'm a university guy. Seven in the morning, you know, it was like three in the morning, seven in the morning, I couldn't even think. Now I'm opposite. I get up early and now, now I'm dead tired at nine at night. But back in those days, I couldn't get up for a seven a.m. for me to save my life. Yeah. <laughs> I talk to young people, they go, I'm trying to get up early. I go, no, go with the schedule that works for your life, actually. Yeah, There's yeah. nothing special about this time, this time, or this time. It's when you're alert. Just get at a, a time when you're alert. In this season of my life, key. That is I'm key very point. tired at night, but very alert in the morning. I'm, that, I'm, that is key because sometimes there's this legalism related to it. If it's not in the morning, See, I'm alert at 5 a.m., yeah. but I'm dead at 9 p.m. But when I was 18, it was the exact opposite. <laughs> and in my 20s, I hated 6 a.m. Per- hated them. Hated, I didn't mind evening ones, though. I hated morning ones. And, and, but I got free, but I just said, I'm going to do it when I'm alert. But anyway, so I sat that 9 o'clock hour at the university for three months, and... Five, five days a week, not seven days a week. And I did it like 90% of the time I actually did it. I go, it's like a class. It's like I was on the university football team. I, they said so the practice was at three o'clock. I showed up every day at three o'clock. I didn't say, hey, if I got something going on, I'll do it. I'll, no, yeah, the coach out, said, so yeah. you show up to the practice, that is non-negotiable. And, and I found out I actually did it four to five days a week. I didn't like what happened in the prayer time, but actually I was actually praying. So now the next thing is the prayer list because the prayer schedule helps you know when to do it. And I don't, I never kept it hundred percent. And that's not the only time I prayed. I prayed over 40 years, many times outside of that, outside of that scheduled time. And many do, you times. Have, do you have a list that it, you write down every day or is it, it is a digital one? What do you recommend? No, no, I don't write down every day because you'd never do it. Okay. I, I write down, I got, there's three different lists that I have. And okay. here's why I write down a list. Because a list, I don't pray the list every time, but a list gives me a focus. Because when I go to my prayer time, typically I'm a little tired or flustered from the last six hours of doing whatever I was doing. I'm talking about over the last 40 years. I look at my prayer list, I go, oh yeah, that's what, yeah, okay. I remember now. The list gives me a focus. So I have prayer for my inner man, for my internal life in God and ministry. So, and and I've, I've really simplified it. I have a 10... Uh, letter acronym, fellowship, F, fear of God, E, for endurance, L, for love, and I have an acronym. I used to have all those categories written down, but I didn't have an acronym for it. I just, I kind of forced them into the acronym, I, but I, I had 10 or 12 areas, and I wrote them down. I didn't do it in one day. I had like two areas for my inner life in God. I want to grow in love, to love God more. I want to grow in the fear of God. Then I do a little more. I want to grow in understanding of the Bible. I wrote that down. It took me a, maybe a year or two to get 10 or 12 on the list. But then when I went to my prayer time, I knew what to say. Yeah. I never kept it 100%. And I never, I get way off the subject anytime I want to. Yeah. But when I lose a sense of inspiration of another area, and I'm kind of bewildered. I look at my list. I just do the next one then. Yeah. It's amazing how that has helped me. So before you go to the next point, walk us for a few seconds. You have you have 10 in your acronym or yeah. whatever it is. It is 10. It is actually, Fellowship yeah. is 10. I've got it down to 10. I've slipped a few of my other things, uh, uh, subjects yeah. into those. So you have, let's say, three hours yes. in one day. Do you have already uh, planned to have like the first hour in the middle of my hour is after I read the, a passage or I skip them here and there? Just walk us through it. Okay, or if no I, I got a two-hour prayer. I got a two-hour prayer meeting. I got that acro. Well, I got three prayer lists. I got the the prayer for my inner life in, min- yeah. in my ministry. Secondly, prayer for people and other ministries. Okay. Like I pray for YWAM. I pray for Cairo, Egypt. I pray for Jerusalem. Cairo and Jerusalem are two cities I've walked into. We've prayed a lot for over the years for North Korea. You know, for, there's some real hot spots in the world for things in Syria. So I, I've got some ministries like YWAM and some of the top leaders, John Dawson, Lauren Cunningham, Mark Anderson, just different ones. Yeah. Uh, Andy Bird. I've got a few of them that I, I want to pray. But when I'm tired, I kind of forget. I look, I go, oh yeah, 
And John Dawson, of course, my dear friend. <laughs> but I've made a commitment to pray for him. So, so I have a prayer list of cities or ministries. Yeah. And then thirdly, there's a justice prayer list, you know, like ending of abortion, stopping of human trafficking, of some of the legal, the darkness that's happening in our legal systems, you know, where the word of God is being driven out of the culture. So those are three just real simple little prayer yeah. lists. And what I really love to do is open up, and I'm reading the Gospels, you know, I'm, at, I'm reading Matthew 10, and I'm taking the Bible and turning it into conversation. That's my favorite, yeah. is when I'm just reading the Bible, prayer, pray reading the Word, where I'm yeah. turning the Word into conversation. So now I got a two-hour prayer time. So I sit down, and I don't have to do those three lists every time. Oh, yeah. I got my Bible in front of me. Of course, I'm at IHOP. I got anointed music up on the stage. I'm going, ooh, this is going to kind of get fun. I always get out my paper for journaling. I always got my laptop. And, and often now, I just put my Bible program open, and I'll read it. Sometimes I'll read. I have my hardcover, my hard copy Bible there, but often my Bible's here. And I want to journal. I want to write down what I'm, what I'm praying, because if it inspires me, I write it down. Mm -hmm. Even if it, I look at it a week later, it doesn't inspire me the next time. But if it inspires me a little bit, I want to get the language of it. Because it's like the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I give it to you. And it doesn't always move me, but it does sometimes. Yeah. And so I go back to the same things over and over. So it's, let's say, two in the afternoon, and I've done my Bible for a little while, and then I go, you know, I want to do my fellowship acronym, those 10 things. But I'll take maybe only two minutes on each one, or maybe one of them I'll spend six minutes on, then I'll skip the other one, and skip the other one, then maybe eight minutes on one, and then skip the other three. <laughs> I'm not committed to do all 10, but they're always there in front of me. I do my fellowship prayer often when I'm driving. When I'm driving, I got a five minute drive, a nine minute drive, I go, I, instead of listening to music, I just go, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. I go, I'd rather just talk to the Lord, but I'm real engaged in what I just did and what I'm about to do. I'm a little bit spacey. Well, start with F, fellowship, F, fear the Lord. Lord, Psalm 8611, unite my heart to fear your name. Lord. Increase the fear of God. So I'm driving. Uh, I do that for about a mile or something. Then I go, E, endurance. Oh, I feel a little weary. That's the same as perseverance. Give me, that's Colossians 1, verse 10. Give me endurance, strengthen me so I don't cave in on yeah. just the weariness of the task. I need supernatural endurance. L, love. I want to bound in love. Father, the way that you love your son, Jesus prayed that you would impart it into me and give me an impartation of love for your son. And, you know, and I go right down through the list. And so I often do that when I'm driving more than when I'm sitting in the prayer yeah, room. That's the importance of the, of the acronym that you can just pull it from yeah. your mind in a second. And see, in the old days, I, I, I had the 12 or 13 categories memorized, but sometimes I would just, I had to stop and think them through, but the acronym makes it so easy. Yeah, yeah. And again, I crammed a few topics together to make the acronym work <laughs> because I couldn't think of a 10 letter acronym, uh, acronym like this, but it's fellowship with God. You know, first yeah. John three, one, three, our fellowship is with the father and the son. I go, there you go. It's a perfect word, you know? And so then the last thing in terms of growing a prayer is a right paradigm of a perspective of God. He's a tender father. We automatically have the idea of the distant father, the angry coach, the stern teacher, the authority figure in our life that kind of, ugh, you know, they, I mean, they crack the whip, but we're not real sure. We want to be and open my heart with them. <laughs> but when we have the right image of the father, the Luke 15, the father that rejoices over the prodigal son who's returning, the father who's celebrating anyone returning to him, then you run to him instead of from him. And you get the right view of God, then you want to pray. You want it's to run enjoyable. to him. It's all about pleasure. Yeah, I like being in his presence because he's smiling at me. Yeah. So anyway, those are some practical, three practical things. Get a schedule, develop some prayer lists. And I've got several of them on our, on my, our website, the MikeBickle.org website. we got a few lists there. And I got a lot of it in, in the book, Growing on Prayer. I break this down in a lot more detail. But there, there you have it. There's a simple, practical plan. But I want to guarantee you, you get a prayer list, you get a schedule, right view of God, I guarantee you, you'll pray 10 times more in the next three months or 12 months than you ever did before if you do this. Come on.